This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Food fight, it's true. Prices are falling, and while that may be good for consumers, it's putting a lot of pressure on grocers. From none to one, an Arizona county will not go down as the first region to have zero Obamacare plans. But that's not easing the concerns of one family. Brain drain. As baby boomers retire, some companies are trying hard to hang on to their older workers longer. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, September 8th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Food prices are falling, and while you may not be feeling it just yet, your portfolio may be, and supermarket stocks are definitely being strained. The latest is super value. That grocer cut its profit outlook for the year in large part because of food price deflation, but also because of increased competition. And that sent shares of super value down 9.5% in trading today. And it's not just super value. Yesterday, we reported that Sprouts Farmers Market cut its guidance because of significant ongoing deflation. California-based Smart and Final Stores cut its outlook for in July for the same reason. And Dollar General also mentioned deflation as a threat on its earnings call last month. Tomorrow, Kroger, the country's largest supermarket chain, and a barometer for the industry reports earnings, and many are expecting to hear much of the same. Susan Lee takes a look at the expiring fortunes of the grocery industry. A carton of eggs, 40% cheaper. Whole milk that costs 11% less. Beef, pork, and chicken at a discount from 2015. Food prices have been falling for nine straight months, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and on track for the longest stretch of declines in 50 years. Dairy prices have come down because the price of dairy has gone down because of so much supply. And as a result, it's great for the consumer, not as good for the supermarkets. Super Value and Sprouts are among a number of food sellers have blamed food deflation as a threat to their bottom lines. But it's not just falling prices that's pressuring earnings. There's also a grocery price war underway as grocers are cutting prices to gain market share and big entrants muscling into the grocery game like retailing giants Walmart and Europe's Aldi. Probably one of the larger step changes in the food retail industry happened a few years ago when, you know, a lot of your conventionals and big boxes started to pay attention attention to, you know, things such as natural, organic, good for you type of items. More recently, you've had some sharpening of those prices, whether it's Walmart, whether it's, um, you know, some of these, these Aldi's, which are more kind of deep discount oriented. Many analysts say that cheaper protein prices should continue into next year. And in such a competitive environment, there will be some winners and some losers. It really hurts a lot of the regional grocers. Their margins or the profit line is very thin for um, a grocer to make some money. And as a result, there's a lot of pressure if you're not a very good executor or have scale the way a Kroger or Walmart does. At the end of the day, there is a clear winner as a result of falling food prices, the American household who can spend less on their grocery bills each and every week. For Nightly Business Reports, I'm Susan Lee. Let's bring in Joe Feldman, whom you just saw in that report to continue our discussion on falling food prices and the impact it is having on some of the nation's grocers. Joe, I, I know what the numbers say. It doesn't maybe feel that way at the supermarket when you go in. Right. You mentioned just in that piece how thin the margins are for grocery stores. How thin are right. they and what can they do? Well, let's put it this way. For every dollar of sales that, you know, the grocer makes, uh, they generate around two, two and, a, two and a half to three cents of profit on the bottom line. So it's really thin. Um, most of that is going to pay for the cost of the food, to pay for the labor, to run the operation. It's a very capital intensive, uh, you know, industry that actually requires a lot of those labor items, you know, and people in the stores. Yeah. What, where do you think we are in the deflationary mm -hmm. cycle, Joe? Closer to the beginning or closer to the end? I feel like we're more middle to the second half. Um, it, 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 look, nine months straight is, as you mentioned in the segment, it was the longest period we've had really in 50 years. You know, our view is 
sometime late this year, maybe early next year, you get back to kind of neutral. Uh, we have seen, you know, puts and takes there. For example, produce, w produce was highly deflationary earlier this year, and now it's kind of come back, and it's a little bit back in a positive territory. So I think once the supply-demand balance comes into shape, we'll be okay. So it feels like we're more middle to second half right now. When you've got prices doing, Joe, what they seem to mm -hmm. be doing now, it would put a premium, it would seem to me, on the companies that can really execute terrifically well. Which companies, in your view, are the ones that can do that and thus might be the better stocks sure. to look at today? Well, Kroger is right at the top of the list. I think by far they're the best at execution. They've got a terrific management team. They execute really well. They're forward thinking. They've got great data analytics to help with pricing. And they do it better than anybody. You've got to think about a Walmart. They're very good executors, and they've got scale. And they're the largest grocer in, in the nation. That's going to help. Um, those two guys are going to be big winners, I think, within this space. I think it's the smaller regionals, the mom and pops. That's where there's pressure. Now, there's definitely good, good ones, like there's Wegmans, there's HEB, does a good job in the southeast, uh, Publix. But some of those regional players, it makes it very difficult, like we heard from Super Value today. Really challenging results, both uh, you know, in their own food business, in their Save-A-Lot business, which is very much like that deep discount Aldi uh, company. So there's, a, there's definitely pressures in the grocery world right very now. Very quickly, what about Whole Foods? Because it seems to take away some of the market share from like the sprouts of the world and, and things like that. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I think for a while, Sprouts was probably taking some share from them. I think that some of the mass grocers like the Kroger's, the Walmart's, and, you know, all those regionals that I just mentioned are actually taking some share from Sprouts and from Whole Foods because they're going after organic and natural. It's a hot growing part of the business. And they're, now you can get it at, at your one-stop shop mm -hmm. when you go in a Kroger. All right. So there's pressure on i think whole foods and sprouts and that's not really going to let up in the near term all right joe feldman always helpful always clear we appreciate it thank with you kelsey advisory group appreciate it on wall street stocks came under pressure despite a rise in oil prices investors were also paying close attention to the european central bank which surprised the markets by not extending its stimulus program and we'll have more on that in just a couple minutes here are the closing numbers for you the dow jones industrial average fell 46 points to 18,479. The Nasdaq was off 24, pulling back from its record, and the S&P 500 dropped four. The number of Americans filing for unemployment benefits unexpectedly fell last week. Initial jobless claims dropped by 4,000 to remain near historically low levels. The report suggests that the job market remains tight and that firms are reluctant to lay off workers. Consumer spending is an important part of the economy since it accounts for about 70 percent of economic activity. In an interview today on CNBC, the CEO of Bank of America said he's optimistic about Americans' ability to spend and borrow. The year-to-date consumers on our debit and credit cards are spending 4.7 percent more than they did last year in the pace of accelerating. So the consumer is in very good shape, credit quality-wise, spending-wise. Um, and if you thought about what could slow them down, it'd be confidence in the markets. Those seem to be in good shape. It could be confidence in the economy, not growing as fast as we want, but continuing to grow. Unemployment levels, am I going to have a job? Am I going to get paid more? You're seeing wage growth. Not, again, what people would like to mm -hmm. see, but in the mid-twos, unemployment staying low. So the consumer is very constructive. Moynihan also said his bank, which is the nation's second largest lender by assets, is prepared for any move in interest rates. European economy has been a concern for global investors, and today the head of the European Central Bank surprised the market by doing nothing. The CECB failed to extend the deadline for its trillion, dollar, year, trillion euro stimulus program, leaving many investors disappointed. Annette Wiesbach reports tonight from Frankfurt. Draghi is sitting on his hands when it comes to expanding or enlarging the quantitative easing program the European Central Bank has in place. And that comes despite really sluggish inflation. We had inflation at very low levels for the month of August. The economy is not doing greatly, but they are still sitting on their hands saying they want to wait until they see the effects of uh, other tools 
is actually reaching the markets. There is no need to act, he was saying, as of today. But he was also saying that they're working on further measures. They are have tasked the relevant committees in their words, meaning they are talking about either expanding the purchase program into other asset classes. He wouldn't exclude buying stocks, but he of, of course would not say, yes, that's a good plan. And also another alternative is that in the future they might even buy bonds which yield less than the deposit rates, which currently stands at minus 0.4 percent. In essence, what we can still do here is to wait and see. Probably in October or December, we'll get more monetary easing from the European Central Bank. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Annette Weisbach in Frankfurt. And coming up from no health exchange options to one. Now one family is figuring out how long it can afford the coverage. The Hanjin shipping bankruptcy, which we have been telling you about, is expected to cause disruptions to port operations for two to three months. A Department of Agriculture report, meantime, says the company's failure will also delay the processing of agricultural products. According to the Wall Street Journal, the bankruptcy of the container carrier has left as much as $14 billion worth of cargo stranded at sea. Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton held a news conference today, her first one since early December, and she used it to go after her rival, Donald Trump. Bizarrely, once again, he praised Russia's strongman, Vladimir Putin, even taking the astonishing step of suggesting that he prefers the Russian president to our American president. Now, that is not just unpatriotic and insulting to the people of our country as well as to our commander-in-chief. It is scary. Her news conference follows a televised forum last night where the two candidates talked about national security. John Harwood joins us now from Washington. So, John, why did she hold this rather rare news conference this morning? Well, so she'd been edging toward that by having reporters fly on the same plane with her beginning this week. But she also had reason to want a reset after that forum last night. She drew the short straw. She had to go first. She got pressed very hard on email and didn't have a chance to rebut some of those statements that Donald Trump made last night, uh, both praising Vladimir Putin and also saying that U.S. generals had been reduced to rubble under President Obama. Two questions here, John. Why has it taken Ms. Clinton so long to meet the press, number one? And how did Trump respond uh, to her comments today? Hillary Clinton has a long-standing, Tyler, uh, skepticism about the value of interaction with the press. This is built up over many, many years. Uh, we all remember the special prosecutor resulting from Whitewater that turned into a long-term disaster for Bill and Hillary Clinton. Uh, so she is, has her guard up. Uh, that wasn't so much the case at the State Department, but it is now, uh, and it's come back in this campaign. Uh, so that's uh, where Hillary Clinton's coming from while she's been reluctant. In terms of Donald Trump, he was very pleased with the results of last night's event, and he shifted uh, from uh, defending a little bit his claim that he had opposed the Iraq war. There's still no proof of that, but he went on offense and said, she doesn't know how to create jobs, and I do. Speaking of Mr. Trump, um, what do the numbers look like at this point, especially after the forum last night? Is there evidence that he's making progress in catching up to Ms. Clinton or not? He does have some encouraging news, Sue. Uh, we have four new swing state polls out from uh, Quinnipiac today. They showed that uh, in the states of uh, North Carolina uh, and also Pennsylvania, he's running behind, but not too far behind. And he's dead even in the states of Ohio and Florida. That suggests a general tightening in the race since the peaks that uh, occurred after the Democratic convention when Hillary Clinton was on a high, Donald Trump was making mistakes. The edges come off that lead. We're looking at a much, much closer race right now. All right, John, thank you so much. John Harwood in Washington for us.
Senators Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and others want answers now from Aetna. In a letter, the lawmakers question the company's decision to pull out of a large portion of its Affordable Care Act business. The lawmakers want to know if the move was motivated by the Justice Department's decision to challenge Aetna's proposed merger with rival Humana. In response, Aetna says it is pulling back due to an increasingly unstable marketplace and that reforms are needed. Residents of one Arizona county will now have at least one option when shopping for health insurance on the exchanges. This after Arizona's Blue Cross reversed its decision and will now offer a plan as part of the Affordable Care Act. But what happened in Pinal County is making one family very nervous. Bertha Coombs reports tonight from Florence, Arizona. For Kyle and Annie Beck, having an Affordable Care Act plan has meant more time to spend with their kids while growing their small business south of Phoenix, Arizona. Hi, it's Annie with Tactical Pest Control. But this summer, Blue Cross of Arizona said it was dropping ACA plans in Pinal County, where the Becks live. Then Aetna dropped out, suddenly leaving 10,000 residents in this community with no ACA options for 2017. We've talked about my wife having to go back to work to get insurance through her job as a teacher, which would be, she would be going to work just to pay for insurance and childcare. Late yesterday, Blue Cross reversed its decision because it didn't want to leave Pinal residents in the lurch, despite facing big losses, nearly 200 million on ACA plans in the last two years and up to $50 million more this year. Blue Cross Senior Vice President Jeff Skalnick says that's why the company's strategy was to cut coverage in the state's two biggest counties, here in Pinal and in neighboring Maricopa, which covers Phoenix. They won't go back to Maricopa as long as Cigna stays on exchange there. It's a pattern happening across the country. Nine states will now have just one ACA insurer for 2017, many nonprofit Blue Cross plans. No health insurance company, even a mission driven nonprofit, can lose large sums of money year after year after year. You don't have to be a CEO or an economist to understand that that math will not work over the long term. Many are raising premiums. Blue Cross of Arizona is asking for a 50% increase. ACA subsidies should soften the blow for most enrollees, not for the Becks, already paying $900 a month. We don't get any subsidies. It's pretty much making an extra mortgage payment every month just to have insurance that's not very good. It's unsustainable for these entrepreneurs. I'm concerned for my children. Concerned for the business, concerned for our, our family. Bertha Coombs, Nightly Business Report, Florence, Arizona. Barnes & Noble says the presidential election will cause sales to fall. And that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The bookstore chain posted lower than expected same store sales and cut that metric guidance for the year. The company blamed its soft outlook on customers staying indoors to follow election coverage. Shares fell 4% to $11.85. Navistar, meantime, saw its sales fall for the sixth straight quarter as weak demand for heavy-duty trucks hampered results. The engine and truck maker also saw its net loss widen. In addition, the company said its defense unit received a subpoena from the Department of Defense regarding a recent government transaction, and the stock, nevertheless, up fractionally at $19.12. Clovis Oncology said the Food and Drug Administration will forego holding a panel discussion regarding the biotech's new drug for ovarian cancer. The regulatory agency recently granted the treatment priority review. Shares up today, 15% to 2801. Twitter is hosting its board meeting today, and sources who spoke to CNBC said the topic of cost cuts will be driving the conversation there. The social media company's management is expected to discuss ways to save money, which could include possible layoffs or spinning off company assets. Shares dropped more than 5.5% to $18.70. Restoration Hardware beat profit and sales expectations, prompting that company to reaffirm its guidance for the year. The home furnishings retailer said the better-than-expected results were due to shipments going out earlier than anticipated. Shares popped 7 percent in initial extended hours trading after ending the regular session up 1 percent to 35.27. The 79 million baby boomers in the U.S. comprise still the largest generation in U.S. history, and over the next two decades, an estimated 10,000 boomers will retire each day. 
That poses a challenge for companies who will see some of their very valued, very knowledgeable employees leave the workforce. Sharon Epperson tells us now what some businesses are doing to avoid a brain drain. 63-year-old Randall Broxma still enjoys coming to the office every day. There are a lot of interesting, bright people here. Uh, they're fun to be with. But after nearly 30 years of work, the last 11 spent with the furniture designer Herman Miller, he says he's ready for a change. I'm part of the baby boomer generation and we get to remake everything, right? So uh, for me, uh, I use the word retirement sort of reluctantly. Baby boomers are known for redefining life at every turn and retirement is no different. The generation is active, engaged and interested in continuing to work in some capacity as they age. I see it as a transition from, you know, the work that I'm doing now to some other kind of work. More than 46 million Americans are already 65 or older, and that age group is growing fast. About 10,000 baby boomers retire and leave the workforce every day. It's a shift that's starting to have an effect on companies big and small. There's going to be a need for employers to hang on to these older workers, these experienced workers, because they don't want that brain drain. As you look down the road, the pipeline, there's not as many younger workers coming along. Some companies, like Herman Miller, are being proactive, trying to avoid this boomer brain drain. We realized very quickly if all those people at once or even half decided to leave the business, it would be detrimental for us. In response, the company began what it calls a flex retirement program, open to employees like Broxma, who are 60 and older. It allows these workers to slowly transition into retirement for up to two years, while at the same time training someone to take their place. Capturing what that person does, how they do it, what the nuances are, the things that are written down in a job description. So it's vitally important that you put something in place to catch this before it goes, because once they're gone, they're gone. Four years into the program, it's been a success for the furniture manufacturer and its workers. I'm earning less, uh, but that also gives me a chance then to look at uh, personal finances and see, uh, can we make it work? For Nightly Business Report, I'm Sharon Epperson. Coming up, the most powerful women in business includes one of the country's most controversial CEOs. Wells Fargo has been fined $185 million for secretly opening millions of unauthorized deposit and credit card accounts. It's a story we first told you about last year. Regulators now allege that more than 2 million accounts were opened and money in customers' accounts were transferred to these news account, new accounts without authorization. In addition to the fine, the bank will also pay restitution to the affected customers. MasterCard is facing damages of about 18, a damages claim, I should say, of about $18 billion. That claim was filed on behalf of U.K. customers who say they were charged higher prices because of MasterCard's high swipe fees. This is only the second claim to be filed under the Consumer Rights Act of 2015, and it is the biggest in U.K. legal history. Well, the most powerful women in business, Fortune magazine, has published its eagerly awaited annual list of the top 50 in its most recent issue. Topping that list is General Motors CEO Mary Barra, followed by Indra Nui, who is now in her 10th year at PepsiCo as the CEO there. Rounding out the top three is Lockheed Martin's chief executive, Marilyn Hewson. With us now is a familiar face and friend to all of us, Susie Garab, senior special correspondent at Fortune. Susie, welcome. Good to have you with us. Great to be here. Miss Barra, about... Barra on top of the list for a second year in a row. Why? That's right. Well, you know, she gets a lot of credit for this incredible job that she did in turning around General Motors. You remember when she took over as CEO, she got hit right at the beginning with this yeah, massive regal. Yeah, that ignition switch thing. But, you know, she was honest. She was direct. She acted decisively um, and led the company through this comeback. You know, the person on the cover 
is Hillary Clinton. Right. <laughs> She's not on the list. It's I thought you were going to ask it? that. Right. Well, you know, this is a list of corporate power players, Sue. Uh, if she wins the election, she will be the most powerful woman in the world, uh, right. let alone on uh, business. But the story is about, is Hillary good for business? I see. Controversial choice coming in at uh, number 23, and that is the CEO of Mylan Pharmaceuticals. Um, Heather Bresch. Heather Bresch. Uh, down one uh, slot this year. Was the list compiled before all the controversy about the EpiPen? Or? They change. It's, it's very fluid. You know how it is in the news business. But, uh, you know, some people might say, why wasn't she even lower? Obviously not the most popular CEO these days, given the way she handled mm -hmm. uh, uh, EpiPen and the uh, price increases. But this isn't a popularity contest. I mean, she is a powerful woman in business. I mean, just looking at her stature, she's the only woman who uh, runs a, a major pharma company, right. um, $9 billion uh, company. And she has a good track record. Revenues are up and substantially since she took over. And the stock has outperformed the S&P. So there's a reason she's on that list. Yeah, there are some new people on the list as right. well. Nine new women. Give us a couple. Well, the first one, uh, the big one, is... Uh, uh, Trisha uh, Griffith, who is the head of Progressive, you know, you know those ads for the yes, auto, the auto, auto insurer. Uh, Not num Flow. <laughs> number. No, she's, Flow didn't make it. <laughs> she's number 18 on the list. Uh, she started. She just became CEO in July. She started out in 1988 as a claims rep, worked her way up, and now she's a CEO. So we the, might see Flow at some point. Maybe. You never know. Maybe. And Beyonce at 51. She's the super bonus, uh, Tyler. I knew yeah. you'd get excited about it. Number 51. Right. Uh, you know, she's more than just a, a rock star and a superstar. She has a business, apparel business, and, uh, um, you know, she's, she's been, has a lot of business savvy, yeah. so she's on the list. And she's the youngest woman on the list. Oh, is that true? She's the youngest as well? 35. Okay. Susie, great as always to great see you. Great to see Thanks you guys. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. Susie Garrett, Senior see you, Special Susie. Correspondent over at Fortune. And that does it for Nightly Business Report tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Sue Herrera. I'm Tyler Matheson. Have a great evening, everybody. See you tomorrow.